wearing heels for the first time after going out after a year that you stayed at home is a terrible like, experience. Why? <laughs> What? <laughs> And we're joined by Adi Shemesh. Hi, Adi. Hi. So uh, for those of you who don't know Adi, uh, Adi is a tech entrepreneur, the founder and former CEO of Trench. Uh, Adi combined her passion for digital currencies and fashion with her experience as an economist at the Central Bank of Israel to formulate the concept behind the innovative startup. So good to have you with us, Adi. Uh, can good you tell uh, our listeners and viewers uh, about Trench? Yes, of course. So Trench started a few years ago um, with the understanding that the fashion industry has come to uh, a point where it's not really efficient. We are all spending tons of money on, uh, on fashion. Yet in the U.S., for example, 80% of the closets of women are conducted by items that are worn maximum three times. So that's really inefficient and where you get stuck with these items we spend tons of money. We don't really have a way out, even though there are wonderful, amazing marketplaces for fashion. Um, you're going to lose about 70 or 80 percent. Uh, so if you think that you're going to wear it even one more time, it's not worth it to sell it. Um, and it comes to a point where we are just hurting the environment. The fashion industry is also suffering a lot because there is a lot of pressure on the brands to create tons of collections each year. Um, and we just came to a point where it's, it's, it could be so much better and more efficient and, uh, and grant everybody what, what they want and for everybody to flourish, um, the industry itself and uh, the customers. Um, so Trench started because we realized that even though there are amazing marketplaces for secondhand fashion, which is today called pre-owned because it's not necessarily secondhand and it's not necessarily old, it can be really things that are very new and barely worn, um, we realized that the evolution of, um, of the pre-owned marketplaces for fashion would be the solution for the masses. Uh, so anybody can become a seller. Uh, and sell, and any item uh, should be able to get sold, even if it's something pretty basic. If you're telling now an industry that 70% of its output is, excess, is in excess, meaning they should be produced 80. 80, even worse, how do you deal with the fact that you might be awaking giants that would want to kind of, let's call it, kill your idea? Well, how do you how do you position it what's your take on it are you discouraged encouraged does it what's your take on it and good question so I'm going to answer it generally generally not just related to to trench I think that you know when you're creating a solution that doesn't go against something but can exist alongside of it um, then it really has the opportunity to prove itself for a long time with no risk of you know, getting attacked until you can see if it's working or not. So for example, you know, it's, Trench had, did not replace actual stores. On the contrary, I, I actually we saw a lot of examples of people that got exposed to new brands through other people and then went and shopped from these brands. The whole idea is to make sure that when you buy something, it's not just something you're going to wear maximum three times and leave it somewhere. The idea is to make the whole industry efficient without actually touching the industry and without um, changing anything to it. So if you buy something and you wear it once or twice, you can put it on a platform and you can let it go. And if you don't have any value loss, which is the key, then you get to a point where you can just... have something new every single day. And all these new things were things that were purchased with money from these brands. But, but hold on, hold on, Ali. I, I, I do want to try to take it a step back from your experience, but also uh, like how things work in kind of these complicated ecosystems. So on one side, I hear you saying, which is important and I think is a kind of a theme that I hear from many people. You say if you, if you, if you, 
narrate the story. In the, it's really important to narrate the story of your, your startup or your idea in a way that doesn't immediately create this kind of attack mode by the, by the ecosystem because the way you've positioned it now, unlike the beginning, by the way, I felt if I'm a fashion uh, you know, a person of interest, uh, I would say, oh, interesting, because uh, new brands, uh, new people will, 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 uh, will uh, get to know my brand because maybe whatever, and, and that's an interesting angle. So that's the one thing. But the second thing is you actually created a way for people to never go to the store again because there is enough like stock out there for at least the next two years for people to just be trading with each other before they replenish with the stores, right? So I think it's, uh, it's like, I, I was just wondering if, 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 if people woke up to this idea or, you know, when I say people, I say the investment community, did you find investors who were like, before the ones who invested that were actually stayed away from you because of that? There is always a risk uh, of running on other people's infrastructure. And no matter which app you do, you will be run, running on another, people, uh, on another infrastructure that's not yours. But when it comes to you know, the risk in it, I think that um, the risks of creating a marketplace um, are extremely high. B2C companies are much harder um, to succeed than B2B. And within that category, marketplace is a very, very difficult one. Um, so the risks that people are looking at are very different at that stage. No one really, if we can come to a point where the whole industry is against me and against Trench, that's amazing. That's a win. That means that Trench grew enough to actually make a huge impact on, on, on a full industry. Like Airbnb actually, did for the hotel. Yeah, I actually want to stop there because you said something that I really think is profound and I want to make sure that people kind of get it. When you do something, and I'm just uh, repeating what you said, but it, it's super important. When you do something that somebody else cares about, that means that, first of all, you reached a certain scale and that you did it well enough for them to care. That's actually a good thing. And it's not scary because then you can start working from there on how you deal with this kind of counter, counter uh, stream, right? Exactly. Like when you manage to get to a point where enough people use you that an industry starts to feel it, a whole industry is feeling the impact of one company, that means you really created a disruption and you, can, you brought value to people that wasn't there um, before. And, and it's natural and it should be this way because the world is really changing. Our needs are changing. The way we communicate is changing. And... And things should change, and industries should change. So, so yeah, I want to I want to stop you for a second and, and talk about one uh, one topic that I think is kind of fundamental that, to everything that you're talking about, and that is about how the platform is actually meant to connect people instead of acting as a mediator and acting as an agent. It's actually acting as a way of bringing people together. Can you talk about how? You know your approach to that, and how, and, and do you think it's just beyond trench? Do you think it's something bigger than, or, or something that will develop beyond, like, and, and kind of take over how we do things? So, I think that the main motivation, even for communities, for most of communities, is not. It's of course it's social, but usually the communities we belong to, they're usually around our own needs and usually it's economical needs. So what we decided to do with Trench was, you know, eliminate the middleman, the commission, but also we used, um, we, we used barter points instead of money. Uh, so you can't buy with dollars, you buy with uh, these trading points that are called diamond, and they function as the money of the app, and you cannot buy them or sell them for dollars. How do you make them? So how, do you, how do I make diamonds then? When you join, you get a few, and it and then you when you upload your first item, you're gonna get a few more based on what you uploaded. So you have motivation to upload something great. Um, but yeah, when you join, you already get a few, and you can already start buying from other people. And the whole idea is to get fashion items with your own fashion items that you're not wearing. So it's actually to utilize those 80% of the closet that you're not wearing in order to get new items. And the diamonds, is, it's just the facilitator. It's just there so you can put value on your items. Um, 
And it depends, you know, it depends on what you're uploading, which brand, what the condition is, but also who you are. We saw that on the platform, some people that were very popular and, and did a good job as sellers were able to price for more. Um, so when it comes to the community, the whole idea was to really break the barrier and remove the barrier of moving one item from a closet to a closet from an economical standpoint, just how to get it to be extremely cheap. Mm. And of course, if you are already in a neighborhood filled with people that have kind of a similar taste or a college campus, um, then it's already uh, the best environment to shop at because you don't really have to do deliveries. You can really save a lot of money just on that. And you can save a lot of money on, you know, getting um, returns for items that are, you know, wrong size, wrong whatever. Um, and the community element, I think it's a byproduct of this. Of course, it's something I always had in mind, but we really wanted to get to a point where people are sort of the filter for, for style. I really love fashion. And when I'm looking to buy something new, usually I have a lot of work to do because I'm an online shopper. So I have tons of variety of options that I can get. Um, and filtering and screening can be really tiring. And the community, that's a really important element, I think, for future filtering of any information in the future. So let's say I have someone that I saw through the platform that shares the same size, but also the same body type and the same style, it's automatically the most, the best filter you can have when it comes to quality. And with technology and with, um, not just with trends, but with any marketplaces that have a community around them, you can get to a point where you can take that amazing filter and, and scale it up. And suddenly the community has power to really make things accessible to you that are really filtered to who you are. Is that, uh, do you think that, you know, because if you look at where the internet and e-commerce is going, you see AliExpress and you see eBay and you see Amazon, and they're like the antithesis of communities and, and everything that you described. So do you see like an undercurrent now of like sharing platforms emerging and then all of a sudden Amazon and the rest realize and they morph into that? Or do you see them already realizing it and maybe I'm not aware that they're already starting to implement like community barter type of activities. The more we um, we advance into this, you know, world of the internet where at the beginning it was just like about, you know, communication. Internet is communication. And the communication is first, you know, us able to talk with each other or, or do things with, with each other that are digital. But the more we advance into this, and it's, it's such a new phenomenon on the internet, the more we will just be able to control our physical environments through technology. So the more uh, it advances, I think that, um, of course, classic industries would have to work extremely hard, but I think it can be a good thing for them too, because they would be able, for example, through like fashion. So you can see which products are selling. You can see which products are not selling secondhand. You can see what people are letting go of, what they're looking for. And it will force industries to be more cautious about what they're selling. It will allow them to, to basically create things that are much more environmental friendly and are in much higher quality. There won't be that pressure of creating things that are really new and dispensable. We would be able, as as uh, as a race, to create things that are going to be better for us because it's going to be a high quality uh, and better for the environment. And it's and that's the impact it will have. It doesn't mean that the industries um, would suffer. You know, I'll, most of them would be able to sell things for even more money, right? Because if right now. Um, I want to sell uh, something that people would use once or twice and then they're not going to use it anymore. They're going to think twice before they buy it. But if it's an expensive dress and they know that it's not just a one-time thing that they're going to have it and like to a certain event and let it go, they're more likely to be able to spend more money on it and they're going to be more likely to want something that is in be of better quality. So I think actually that's a, a you know, really... It's an amazing manifesto for, for the good of the internet. 
And now I want to ask you something that, uh, that, that takes a different take from your uh, kind of uh, background and experience, because you come from a certain place, and I want you to talk generally and kind of not um, maybe specifically about a country. And you lo also launched a company in a different continent, right? Yes. And uh, g I'll take it to my own experience. You know, I, um, uh, I ran um, the, uh, I founded the AT&T Innovation Center and I did a lot of innovation in different companies and I founded my own startup. And then I landed, uh, um, and then I started working in Germany and I thought I knew everything about innovation and how to execute innovation. And then I met the German culture and humbly, after a while, I understood that I have to do things differently, okay? Um, because it's just a different place and different mentality. And it's not, it's, by the way, super innovative country, but you just have to do things differently. And as an entrepreneur in, in a different continent, I thought I knew how to do it, and I, in Germany I didn't, and I had to change. Um, how much of your energy, time, and focus and thinking and planning did you do considering culture and considering what you think is right versus how it's done in the other place? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, with Trend specifically, it was from the very first second, um, the idea was to build it for the U.S. market. So, so you were targeting the U.S. mentality and how the consumers in the U.S. From the very beginning, yes. Generation Z in the U.S., people that are used to buying online, people that are used to meeting people online, people that were born into a world where they have many different shoes as kids, not just like two pairs like we did. Um, and that, that, that are looking for getting more from what they have. Did you say that because this was where you launched or you thought that the platform by large is fitting to the U.S. market? But did you have like a global vision starting like U.S. first or was it like uh, U.S. is big enough for me? What was your like, uh, do you think it makes a difference? Because then you design it for the U.S. How do you take it to Germany? So I think that the, um, I think that this, uh, the value that Trencha can bring for, an, for the Western world specifically, right? Um, it's, a, it's a very global need. Like most women can relate to that. Um, but when you launch something that is uh, very innovative and Trench was, um, it wasn't like that classic uh, consumer thing where 70% of the app is very familiar and then just like the 30% is what you innovate and bring something new to the table. We had so many elements that were new because um, we really just rebuilt the whole behavior about shopping. So you can basically open your phone, you know, shop, not just your closet, but tons of closets that are right around you, get things on the same day, not spend any more money, be able to get something, wear it for like school today, and then let it go tomorrow. Like that's like the fantasy we had. And meet people along the way if you want to. So since we kind of, build the whole idea of how do we create that behavior. We had tons of new elements like the subscription, like the fact that you have um, digital currency that's not tradable before even people were really speaking about digital currencies. The fact that, you know, it's, um, it's not a professional seller marketplace. You know, any 20 year old uh, woman that is extremely responsible should be able to sell. So the whole behavior changed. It's not uh, it's not stores anymore. Is it's that is that is, is, is that too many things that are new? In a way, yes. Because in a way, when you have so many things that are new, um, it takes a lot of research to research, to build, to validate. Um, sometimes you have to build something for validation and then kill it and, and rebuild it, and you know that's that's what's going to happen from the beginning. But that's the right way to go because you don't want to take too big a too big of a risk. Um, so I think it really depends on, on who you are as a person, too. You know, we saw companies, most of the companies that really changed our behavior struggled terribly for the first few years. So if you would like to build something that is more high likely to work, you should probably keep the ratio to 70% familiar, 30% new, and maybe don't even do B2C. Maybe just go to B2B. So it really depends. Two, two things I want to talk about coming from what you just mentioned. First of all, I want to object officially <laughs> on, 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 on you keep saying that B2B is easier than B2C. 
Listen, I've been into the B2B business. <laughs> yeah, I'm not allowed to say that. Huh? It's, no, 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 no. B2B is super difficult. You're, you're selling to professionals. They, uh, they rigorously research. They benchmark. They have a procurement uh, division. <laughs> They, you know, the contracts can take, you know, they can be... Yeah, it's hard. I didn't say it's not hard. <laughs> it's as hard, if not, it's, it's, it's different. Okay, let's agree it's different. And we're not saying one is harder. I think it's just a different talent, maybe, to sell to... So a let's, let's say it in a more accurate way. Statistically, there are more successful B2B companies by far than B2C companies. Is that a fact? Yes, I, it is. I, I don't know. We'll check it. We'll do a fact check. Well, we're talking about technological companies, right? Yeah, like, but... Uh, uh, not my barber shop. No, uh, no, before. no. But I think or there the are... Uh, actually, I think there are very few B2C, uh, B2B companies compared to endless B2C companies. You're talking about the mega B2C companies, right? I'm talking in general. You know, like um, the more risk you take, the bigger you can get. Um, but it, when it comes to just like facts, I'm not talking about the giant B2Bs or the giant B2Cs. If you're comparing just B2C companies to B2B companies, there are many more B2B companies that are able to generate revenue for their investors and to maintain workplaces for people than B2C companies. Interesting. But when a B2C company succeeds, the success is usually much more impressive and, and, and much bigger. Okay. To be continued. Anyway, I just wanted to object. Um, <laughs> I, I think we reached a, a good settlement here. Uh, on the other, so maybe just to fast forward now, because you know, like I want to hear what you think about the future, and I want to I want to ask it in a in a very specific way. So I have this thing I call it the exponential question, right? And and try to disconnect yourself from who you are as much as you can, or or what you did with Trench. And I want to give you my theory about the future. And I want you to agree, disagree, or, or give me your take on it when it comes to specifically maybe fashion and consumption, because that's what we talked about, right? So I think that in the future, we might not even, and I'm, not, I'm talking like 10, 15, 20 years, uh, we might not even consume in any way that's similar to how we're actually consuming today. I will just have some type of super cool printer in my home. And maybe a few printers, right? A printer for food, a printer for clothes, a printer for X. I'll have, let's call it, for lack of a better word, like espresso capsules, and they will be the threads for the for the T-shirt or the whatever for whatever else I'm making. I stick it in the machine. What I get from the brand, because they might still exist, is a blueprint of the thing that <laughs> was advertised to me, which I want because desire will still live. And then I desire this amazing new whatever. Let's let's say it's a it's it's it's, it's a t-shirt because I desire t-shirts. And then uh, <laughs> and then I just stick it into the printer. I press mm, and then it, the 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 t-shirt comes out. And you know what? Because we're like living in a sustainable world, I won't even put it on some platform. It'll just dissolve if I throw it away. And maybe it can become the material for my next t-shirt. What do you think? I think it's very accurate. I think that the last sentence is really like, I do think and believe that the way the industry will be built because so much we learned from, you know, environment today and materials, if there would be a way to take your old clothes, for example, and reuse the fabric to print something new, um, everybody benefits. Everybody benefits. It's just the right way and and there can eventually it's all about the business model and the business model that will support that that will make sure everybody benefits from it because it's the right way to do things um would win that's that's what i believe the thing that creates most value to most people will win in the long term so i think that yes very likely we will be able to print out the things that we want you know companies would be selling uh some companies would be selling the fabrics Maybe it's the same companies or not that would be selling um, uh, the the design itself. Maybe it's going to be individuals, right? Maybe we will have, just like today, anybody can do Photoshop through their phone and create professional images, which is something that was unbelievable a few years ago. Maybe every person could kind of create their own design and sell it. Maybe that's also going to be a marketplace. Um, and I think it's it's very likely 
I also think that uh, when it comes to the fashion industry, we need to remember that also the world is really moving digital and that physical and digital are starting to mix up. So even uh, today, when you look at Instagram, most of the people, it's automatic filters are cameras on the phones. If you have an iPhone, for example, it already has an, a built-in uh, filter. So already you get a distorted um, view reality. Yeah. And I think that um, with AR coming and like AR glasses, that's going to change things tremendously. I, I want to hope that following COVID-19 fashion would become much more comfortable and convenient. Mm -hmm. As a woman, I can say, and with speaking with many other women around the world, we don't like heels anymore. Like wearing heels for the first time after going out after a year that you stayed at home is a terrible like, experience. Why? <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I don't like this anymore. And, it's, it, and it sucks because it's gorgeous. But I think that, you know, that combination would probably create a world where we are wearing extremely comfortable fabrics. And, you know, there are tons of amazing technologies out there now for, like, weather control and things like that. Um, we would, everything would also have data and tracking in it. And through AR, we can wear all these crazy things. You know, you could be wearing a Louis Vuitton dress on the street and you're going to be actually be in, like, sweatpants. Um, but, but whoever I think see it, you yeah. with the glasses would see you wearing this gorgeous Louis Vuitton dress, which Louis Vuitton will sell to you online. Yeah, it's just like the a, ability to wear it. It's like the skin on 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 the, on uh, on uh, uh, Minecraft or whatever one of those games that you buy stuff yes. on. So I think that you know, and, and when you look at gaming and social media, I think that you know, if you would compare a crazy gamer into like a crazy. Um, fashionista blogger on Instagram, they would feel that they don't really have anything in common, but actually they share so much in common because they all, they both have digital lives and they both um, spend a lot of their life um, communicating with people digitally. And they're creating these images of themselves, which is themselves. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a certain version of myself that exists in the online world. It's uh It's like a parallel universe in a way, but it's very real. Um, and I think that this will start to mix into our own reality once we have these glasses and we're able to just like appear however we want. And maybe, you know, if I see you on the street, I, I would want you to see me, you know, with my makeup on and with a really gorgeous, beautiful dress. Um, and if it's a, and if it's a potential, uh, client for my consulting services, then I would want them to see me in like, a like this, you know? So it, it really depends. Um, and I think that it's going to be crazy. So actually, that was a super optimistic and, and cool way to kind of wrap it up. And I think we have a few startups to go and start to work on. I can think of like <laughs> three that just came out of the last five minutes. So I think we have some work ahead of us. It's been great to have you on, Adi. See thank you. you. It was really fun. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to thank our viewers and listeners and meet you on the next episode. Bye.